preliminary issue, but the manner in which we think it best and appropriate to deal with it is to proceed with the arguments. We have um, Ms Richards and Mr Roach's skeleton argument on the points that they will make as to whether or not we should entertain ground two, ground two yeah. and we can deal with that in the course of our judgment, which of course will be reserved. Is that acceptable to both of you? I lose me, sir. It, it is, my lady. Thank you very much. Thank you. My ladies and my lords, um, I am leading Sarah Hammett, uh, uh, Casey and Emily Wilsden, uh, and the respondents are represented by uh, Jenny Richards, Casey, Stephen Broach, and Catherine Barnes, who happily is not present because uh, she's just had a baby girl. Oh. So uh, uh, that's the representation. Uh, the introduction is going to be very brief. Yes. As you know, in this appeal, there are two issues uh, subject to the point you've just mentioned. The first of them goes to when a process is to be characterised as consultation. It proceeds on the basis that if something is to be so characterised, then the gunning principles would necessarily apply as the legal concomitant. The second issue, subject to the permission points, goes to whether that concomitant truly represents the law. It raises the question whether merely characterising something as, quote, consultation does have that legal consequence in other words, whether the gunning principles automatically follow, or whether the true control of the manner in which the process is conducted is rationality. As you've already noted, the second issue was not argued below and needs the court's permission. Uh, Lady Justice Whipple uh, dealt with uh, the matter uh, by leaving it to this court at the full hearing. See for that purpose her order in relation to the various permission applications that were made before the court at an earlier stage. Core bundle, page 105, especially paragraph 6 for present purposes. And I was going to propose, but my lady is ahead of me, to develop the argument, and the court can then no doubt deal with it as it sees fit in its judgment. Yes, thank you. I should say at the outset, as the final short point by way of introduction, that there was and is no dispute that if the gunning principles apply, uh, uh, that is the end of it. They were not complied with. I wanted to start with a brief section, if I may, turning straight to the issues, dealing with the core basic principles at which govern the manner in which decisions are taken as a matter of public law. Uh, and I start with that as a general topic because I will then come against that backdrop and in that context to the two issues that confront the court. Uh, and so I take these first because they provide the context for both of the issues that confront you. And I wanted to make six general submissions under that heading, if I may. The first is that the general and overarching position is that the process by which government makes decisions is in effect that decisions about process are for government, subject only to rationality. That public law principle recognises, therefore, that it is primarily for government to make decisions about process. And so rationality, as the control, recognises that it is for government to choose between the variety of rational procedural options. That basic constitutional approach is reflected, of course, and as is well known to the court, in the Thameside Doctrine, too well known to be uh, recited or gone over again here. Uh, it, it, it was clearly recognised by Lord Justice Laws in the Khartoum, K-H-A-T-U-N, the Khartoum decision, in two related propositions set out by him. Can I invite you to take up the appeal, the appeal authorities bundle? I don't know whether my ladies are working electronically or in hard. Quite hard by the look of it. Uh, we're doing both. You're doing both. Very well. I'll give you both, both references. So it's uh, it's authorities tab ten, and the page I want is three four seven. Uh, 
facts of the case don't matter. 347, which should take to paragraph 35, which I'm hoping is one of the sideline passages in Khartoum. Yes. And if I just invite you to cast your eye down paragraph uh, 35, if you would, I I'll then give you the two related propositions which we respectfully suggest can be drawn from that. Himself uh, draws, or just as Laws himself draws attention to the different but closely related nature of the two propositions, about four or five lines into the paragraph. And the two propositions are firstly that it's for the decision maker, not the court, to decide what is relevant to consider subject to the supervision that is rationality. And secondly, that it's also for the decision maker and not the court to decide on the manner and intensity of the inquiry to be undertaken prior to making a decision. Uh, those points are hopefully picked up and summarised by, no one's not allowed to say a strong divisional court, but a strong divisional court nonetheless, one of the allowed to offer a view on its strength, subject to what I say on Friday in court. Um, uh, 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 tab 19, page 546, is Plantagenet Alliance which, as you will recall, was about the bones of Richard III. Uh, and the relevant paragraphs for present purposes are 569, uh, where uh, Lady Justice Hallett hopefully summarises uh, the relevant principles in dealing in particular with um, the two topics that may be of some interest Firstly, the duty to carry out sufficient inquiry slash the Thames side duty. You see the title above, paragraph 99. And again, can I just invite you to read to yourself rather than reading out, particularly paragraph 100, which we respectfully submit accurately summarises the approach in relation to inquiry. Drop of six sub-propositions, as you see, or sub-paragraphs, as you see. So whether to engage with the public or a section of the public as part of a decision-making process, and I deliberately cast it in those terms, using that to cover everything from specific decisions about individual cases to general policy approaches in the loosest sense, but whether or not to engage with the public as part of decision-making is an example of uh, both types of proposition referred to by Lord Justice Laws in Khartoum. In other words, what is relevant to consider and the manner and intensity of inquiry. And so the punchline of this first submission is that the starting and the default position in principle is that those sorts of decisions are subject to control through the light touch of rationality for good constitutional reasons. The second proposition is a, is a short and rather more basic one, and it is that when the government is considering a policy area or a decision, it will very often consider it expedient to engage with the public or a section or sections of the public as part of that process. That is an aspect of making rational decisions about the process of decision making, and it's an aspect of 
the proposition that what matters uh, to government is a matter for it to consider and make decisions about. The third proposition is that engagement both is not ordinarily required in public decision making, in governmental decision making. There's no duty normally to engage. And the fact of engagement does not of itself trigger any particular set of public law obligations. Plantagenet again, if you still have it open, if you just flick back a couple of pages to page 567, you will see under the heading uh, two-thirds of the way down the page, duty to consult, that the court did what it did further on under duty to carry out sufficient inquiry, did the same summary of the relevant uh, approach in principle in relation to the duty to consult. Again, a helpful encapsulation of the variety of principles uh, that the courts have uh, alighted on to govern that uh, subject matter. And you see in particular for the purpose of this point, in other words, that engagement isn't ordinarily required, the proposition which, with which uh, Lady Justice Hallett starts at 98 sub 1, there is no general duty to consult the common law. The government of the country would grind to a halt if every decision maker were required in every case to consult everyone who might be affected by his decision. Uh, that of course, that principle it, it is of course subject to a possible duty derived from fairness to engage with and possibly receive representations from a person whose legally protected interests might be immediately affected by the decision under consideration. That uh, has been variously described by courts, and I'll come to one decision in a moment, but variously described as being part of the principle of natural justice, uh, audi ultra impartum and all of that. Uh, but the distinction between consultation on the one hand and procedural fairness on the other, in other words, the procedural fairness aspect of engagement with the public or a section of the public, is well recognised in the case law. Uh, perhaps the best illustration of it, if I may respectfully say so, is in the judgment of Lord Justice Singh in the Kebble Developments case, tab 22, and the paragraphs I want, again, the facts don't matter, the paragraphs I want start at paragraph 60 uh, on page 632. And uh, just to pick it up, as it were, at 61, you will see that the, uh, 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 Lord Justice Singh uh, draws attention to the fact that the Sterling case, which had been incited uh, to the court, concerned a situation where there was a statutory duty. There was no issue, therefore, about the existence of the duty in that case. And then you'll see the distinction being drawn or beginning to be drawn at paragraph 62. Can I just invite you to read 62, probably through to the end of 69, with particular attention, if I may, because they summarise what the uh, 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 Lord Justice drew from the case law that he'd cited, 68 and 69, but uh, 62 to 66 before that, or 67 before that, a useful introduction to those two key paragraphs, 68 and 69.
you'll see where I got legally protected interests. In relation to those those adversely affected, it's Roman 1 in paragraph 68. But you see the essential distinction that is being being drawn, we submit correctly by Lord Justice Singh in that uh, helpful analysis. But in any event, the core point for present purposes is with that distinction well in mind, and those exceptions well in mind, as it were, engagement both is not ordinarily required and the fact that the engagement doesn't trigger any set of particular obligations ordinarily. It's just governed by uh, rational decision-making about the process by which a decision is taken. That's the third proposition. The fourth proposition considers the exceptions. There are circumstances in which engagement with the public may be subject as part of the decision making process, may be subject to different, more onerous obligations. And by that I mean where the choice inherent in rationality is curtailed. So more ob onerous obligations are imposed on the decision maker as a matter of process. But those are the exceptions. That is the exception to the position of rationality control only. They may be those sorts of controls engrafted by the statutory imposition of statutory or more onerous obligations as to the manner of decision-making. A paradigmatic example might be the public sector equality duty imposed under Section 149 of the Equality Act. Consultation is another, and it fits in here, whatever its source, as an exception to the usual position where you are required to consult with a section of the public. It isn't just a matter of rational decision making. Public law imposes that obligation upon you. The fifth proposition builds from that. That exceptional status is reflected in the principles applicable to the question whether a duty to consult arises in the first place. There is a relatively narrow gateway through which you have to pass if public law is to impose that duty. And the, the gateway is very well known. The duty to consult arises either by imposition through statute or through imposition as a matter of public law. We don't need to trouble any further with statute because that's done in a variety of ways, almost invariably expressly and almost invariably subject to some form of statutory provision about the manner in which the consultation has to happen. Consult those whom the Secretary of State sees fit, consult the following bodies in particular, however it may be. But that statutory provision, we don't need to worry further about that. Public law, however, imposes the obligation in very limited circumstances. In short, only in two circumstances. The first is where a legitimate expectation of consultation has been created. As you will be again very well aware, legitimate expectation requires a promise of the requisite clarity and unequivocality. The promise can be expressed or it can be by past consistent conduct, but even if it's by past consistent conduct, that conduct has to carry with it an inferential promise that it will continue to be followed in the future. Wilson and Gaines Cooper and lots of other well known cases. So, legitimate expectation is one, that's category A, as it were, or B, and these are exhaustive, very exceptionally, where it is necessary to avoid conspicuous unfairness. Again, just to give you a reference to a summary of those principles under the duty to consult, we started with it, you saw under the heading saying the consultation duty, it was that paragraph 98 and following, those propositions <coughs> are 
it is built into the paragraphs that follow as a summary of principles. See for your note, paragraphs 97 and following of Plantagenet authorities, tab 19, page 567, should get you there. So there are strictly limited and very specific circumstances in which public law will impose a duty to consult, and they are based on the idea that unless you hear from someone, leaving aside legitimate expectation of a promise, unless you hear from someone by way of consultation, there will be conspicuous unfairness. The sixth point is really one to note. As to the manner in which consultation occurs, there may still be scope, even when the duty is triggered to consult, there may still be some scope for discretionary decision-making uh, and rational decision-making. For example, unless the statute has set this, in relation to the cohort to be consulted. Who is to be consulted if that isn't indicated by the government? However, the gunning requirements, which are the central focus of this appeal, are based either in fairness, and I'll come to the authority in a moment, but that's the justification that one sees in Mosley, the Supreme Court decision in Mosley, paragraph 25, tab 20, page 593 to 594, or at least in ensuring that the public participation in the very often statutorily required consultation is protected as effective. I need to come back to Mosley, but you have the paragraph in Mosley again, that's a well-known decision. So those are the six general propositions that provide the context for the issues uh, in, in this appeal. And the first of those issues is as to characterization and how characterization should be approached. In other words, when something is to be characterized as a consultation. And that arises, of course, because it is uh, the premise for this appeal that there was no statutory obligation to consult and there was no public law obligation to consult. Permission was refused in relation to that issue by way of cross-appeal, the judge having determined that issue in our favor. So we are dealing with a voluntary consultation. What then is the principled approach to characterization as to whether or not a voluntary consultation is a consultation of a type that would attract, as it were, the automatic application and bringing in of the gunning principles? That's the, the question. And I'm going to divide my submissions on that issue, if I may, in two parts. One dealing with the principled approach to that issue and the second dealing with the application of that principled approach to the facts. So I start with the, with the principled approach that we submit should be adopted to that characterization uh, issue. As we've already seen, the starting point is that the cases have acknowledged that there is a dividing line between, on the one hand, consultation, and on the other hand, engagement with the public. the extent of the significance of that distinction and that dividing line principally flows from the legal incidents that flow from the division. In particular, whether there are more onerous procedural obligations that flow from a characterization of something as consultation. And by more onerous, again, I mean something greater and more specific than a rational judgment by the Secretary of State about the appropriate course that the process leading up to the decision should take. And on that dividing line, see if you would, or we go if you would, to the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Elias in the personal injury lawyer's case behind tab 18 of the authorities, page 532 is the one I want to tab 18, uh, page uh, 532, it starts, and you will 
seen the context of the case from paragraphs 1 and 2 on page 532. If I could just invite you to pass the brief by down. Remember the date. Given who I was reading. 2013. So, uh, Lord Justice... Lord Justice Elias, and, and can I go immediately to page 539? Again, I hope these paragraphs have been sidelined. Because this was a case in which the distinction that I've just indicated between consultation and engagement was key. It was said by the claimant in that case that there had in fact been consultation. We said, no, 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 there's merely been engagement. And, uh, and uh, this was then the subject of the court's reasoning and decision making. Can I invite you again, rather than my reading them out, just because so, there's quite a few points collected in one, but it's, I really go to them for present purposes for that core distinction between engagement and consultation. Can I invite you to reread or read the sideline passages, 43 through to the end of 45? see from those paragraphs, therefore, that it isn't every engagement that triggers the characterization as consultation. The court is very, very clear about the drawing of that distinction, and it's also very clear about the reasons why that distinction is important. See, in particular, the last couple of sentences of paragraph 44, and the second half, at least, of paragraph 45. Whether or not something is to be characterized as consultation uh, is a matter of substance and not form. And I take that from uh, Mrs. Justice Simler's decision, she then was, in the FDA case, tab 24, if you would, very briefly, because I'm sure I just described it substance, not form. FDA tab 24, page 6, 8. Seven. The relevant paragraph is paragraph 99, where she accepts the submission of Mr. Westgate that the question whether a public body has embarked on consultation for these purposes is a matter of substance, not form. You see that in the penultimate sentence on paragraph 99. And can I just invite you to note, apologies, but this was a decision of Mr. Justice Simler wasn't a decision of Mrs. Justice Lang, as we say in our skeleton at paragraph 16. So apologies for that. No, no disrespect to Lady Justice Simler for obvious reasons. So the first submission I make, particularly on the back of the analysis of Lord Justice Elias, 
and his reference to formal consultation and the key reasons why there is a distinction between formal consultation and engagement, is that when something is to be characterised as consultation, or in Lord Justice Allah's words, formal consultation, as he put it, should in principle be rare, by the consultation characterisation should in principle be rare, for the reasons that we have seen, it is in principle for, for decision makers to be afforded the latitude in terms of <coughs> uh, making decisions about the manner of decision making that rationality imports. And that is driven by all of the features that you saw uh, analysed by Lord Justice Elias in personal injury lawyers, the advantages in practical terms, in governance terms, in the onerous procedural baggage, as he put it, that is associated with that characterisation, um, uh, 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 being the exception and not the norm. So it has advantages in terms of practical governance, as he put it in paragraph 45. It's also driven by the constitutional idea of separation of powers, the constitutional uh, division of responsibilities uh, for making these sorts of decisions. Again, that's underpinned lots of Lord Justice Laws' analysis, some of which we've seen in Khartoum, repeated in Plantagenet. You also get the same idea from Lord Justice Sedley in Bapio, which I don't need to go to. We've given you the relevant bit in our skeleton at paragraph 15. But that's the constitutional separation of powers as the justification for this being a rare characterization because it brings with it the procedural baggage. And to the to the governance points that Lord Justice Elias alighted on in the personal injury lawyers, one can add that it might be thought not to be a good idea in terms of good practical governance, as it were, to disincentivize engagement. Engagement is normally considered to be a jolly good thing quality of decision making and the fairness of decision making uh, by central government. That's the first suite of reasons therefore for, that support the submission that imposing that characterisation should be rare. The second is that the that set of procedural obligations that come with the characterisation of consultation flow from having got through the door that public law has created as the trigger to the existence of the consultation obligation in the first place. In other words, that duty flows either from legislative imposition or in circumstances, in effect, in which fairness demands it and demands it because there's either been a promise that you're going to consult, brackets legitimate expectation, or because this is a case or there is a case of conspicuous unfairness. And the narrowness of that category is well known. And if gunning flows from the mere fact of characterization, then that characterization should only flow when fairness in effect demands gunning and in a manner that responds to those principles. And I emphasize, as a subnote to that point, that the situation under consideration here, it should not be forgotten involves a voluntary process. So in effect, if you're going to impose gunning in the suite of procedural obligations, it might be thought that government should be assuming those obligations, even though it is under no obligation to consult, and there is therefore no unfairness which would cause public law to impose that duty and the concomitant gunning duty. So what then do we submit are or should be the requirements for a, a characterization of something as uh, the uh, a, a, as a formal consultation attracting uh, those as the minimum suite of ingredients of what uh, a consultation should be or when gunning should apply just as accurately if one pays attention to the obligations that are the other consequential to that analysis. But what, what are the requirements? We submit, firstly, there needs to be a proposal. And we have set out for you, I don't think I need to turn it up, I'll give you the reference because we quoted it in our skeleton at paragraph 18 sub A, 
we, we gave you the quotation from Lord Justice Morris K in Medway at paragraph 26 of Medway, authorities 8 at 8, page 277, in which Lord Justice Morris K described consultation as, quote, a process within which a decision maker at a formative stage in the decision making process invites representations on one or more possible courses of action. So that's what I mean by proposal. And that is, of course, reflected in the second of the governing principles. If you have a proposal, therefore, you have something concrete and advanced enough to be under active consideration, and that may attract or provide the ability uh, to inform those whom you're consulting of the reasons for it which is one of the gunning requirements, as you know. And the further back, therefore, on that critical path towards decision-making you are, the less likely you will be in the territory where you have something sufficiently formulated, as it were, to put out as a proposal, which would then uh, uh, enable people uh, uh, to understand the reasons for the particular proposal and to produce responses to it or intelligent uh, uh, representations about it. But the further you go back on the critical path, the less likely it is you're going to get there. So first, a proposal. Uh, secondly, and uh, these are all interwoven, obviously, uh, a proposal which is designed to be uh, uh, capable of being subject to a specifically responsive process. So sufficiently developed to enable consideration of it as a concrete proposal or set of proposals and uh, responses. And, and you have an example uh, of uh, the sort of distinction that one uh, that I'm uh, driving at here in, in uh, Mr. Justice Sullivan's uh, decision in the Greenpeace case. If you go to tab 13, page 416 it starts. You see that the decision of Mr. Justice Sullivan and the Admin Court on Greenpeace, and this was all about whether or not there should be a nuclear component in the UK's energy framework. It's so controversial and unsurprising nature of the claimant, as it were, in relation to that set of issues. Can I just invite you to cast your eye down the factual bit of the head note on page 416, so you get the flavour of uh, the argument. And then if you want to read the head note or the disposition of the case, again, I'd invite you to do so uh, briefly. Just so that context of what follows. key bit for present purposes uh, uh, is really, again, obviously all turned on the same fact, but the key bit for present purposes is the distinction that Mr. Justice Sullivan drew uh, between uh, a consultation on the one hand and an issues paper on the other. Uh, it starts at page 441. You will see just above the second hole punch, page 441, that there is a title of issues. see the nature of the argument Mr. Drabble was for the Secretary of State. If you just look at paragraph 65 to 66. And you 
see the nature of the challenge which was being mounted by Mr Fleming in that case uh, on behalf of the claimant. If you just flick back, having read 65 to 66, you get a slightly fuller exposition of what the nature of the challenge was at paragraphs 43 to 44 on page 435. And you will see that in, in essence what was being said was that there had been a promise that there had been a fullest public consultation any alleged expectation there would be such. And they were effectively saying that the 2006 consultation document didn't do it, <laughs> and it didn't do it because it was properly to be characterised as an issues paper. And it was that proposition with which the judge agreed for all of the reasons which he uh, sets out in paragraph 67. And again, I'm not going to go through uh, all of them, but you will note for example that it did contain lots of questions, it did contain an invitation to provide some form of response. See sub 2 and sub 3 on page 442 to go back to analysis in that supports the idea that this was an issues paper. Get a flavour of the judge's reasoning in two and the beginning of three. And then issues again that consider their nature at the top of page four four three. And then you will see in particular sub 4, passage in text above uh, other issues above is immediately followed by this statement. Government is clearly making important decisions about energy policy, including nuclear power. There should be the fullest public consultation. This consultation is part of that process. The government is not at this stage bringing forward policy proposals. And then he says that statement is entirely consistent with the 2006 document being an issues paper, part of the consultation process be followed by policy proposals in which there would be further consultation. And then the conclusion that he reaches is summarised in paragraph 70, the first sentence on page 445. court in Greenpeace is drawing that distinction between on the one hand an issues paper and the other hand something that could be called a consultation properly so called and at least a significant part of the reason why it's characterised as an issues paper is because it doesn't actually bring forward the sort of concrete proposals uh, that I have been referring to it isn't designed to be a specifically responsive process in that sense so I, I, I submit that that is a, a necessary part of something of necessary minimum ingredient before something could be characterised as a, a, a consultation attracting gunning. That's the second of the minimum requirements, therefore, we submit. The third is that there should be an invitation to respond with an indication that the responses will then inform the decision making about the proposal. Again, these are all rather aspects of the same thing, but it's got to be something targeted, it's got to be something which involves. Uh, things that have got to the stage of being proposals is not just a general information gathering thing. Uh, this is a, a, a specific process for which the gunning principles are designed, I may add. So I'm not shy about the link between uh, the gunning principles themselves and the nature of the consultation that would attract them. The nature of the consultation has to be, or the nature of the engagement has to be such, uh, that they would be sensibly applicable. We then identified in our skeleton argument at paragraph 20 um, a range of other matters. And we've taken them broadly uh, by inference, as it were, from the sort of factors that Mr Justice Sullivan was considering in Greenpeace. So we've identified a kind of suite of factors, the stated purpose of the exercise, the nature of the questions asked, the amount of information given uh, in the exercise about the proposals, 
a period of time over the place, the identity of the individuals engaged with, and importantly, perhaps the intention of the decision makers. It, 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 it is the intention, maybe as it were, to gather general background information while you're dealing with specific concrete proposals of the kind that would naturally fit within the concept. Before coming to directly to the application of those principles, I wanted to make two responsive points on the principles approach before coming to it for the application of them. Firstly, uh, 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 my learned friend's definition of consultation is seen in her skeleton argument at paragraph 32, where she describes it as a process by which a decision maker gives concerned parties or stakeholders the opportunity to influence a potential decision before it is made. And there are three problems, at least, we submit, with that as a working definition for the sort of consultation that would attract Gummings. The first is that it has no proper foundation. The definition appears to come from the comments of the Supreme Court in Mosley, but those comments were about the purpose of a consultation. They were not seeking to define what consultation is, as opposed to what it is for. Secondly, it is far too wide as a definition. Those uh, purposes improving decision-making that the court alighted on in Mosley, improving decision-making, avoiding a sense of injustice, respect for democratic principle, and all of that. They are generic, and they are shared by many, many other activities that are not consultation. There are many ways in which stakeholders and the public have opportunities to, quote, influence decisions, and they are not and cannot all be consultation in the strict public law sense with which we are dealing. Influence is therefore far too broad as a controlling, or perhaps the controlling feature of the definition. A minister meets with an MP to hear about his or her constituents' concerns about something. An official attends a conference as a guest or a speaker and engages in a discussion about a proposed policy with either attendees. A minister appears on television and engages in a debate with a representative of an NGO about a proposed policy. There is information gathering. All of those things are capable of influencing. None of those things we submit would, uh, on any view, fall within the concept of a consultation. <clears throat> Thirdly, the width of the claimant's definition would undermine we the ability of government, and indeed a whole suite of other public authorities to whom this principle must apply, to have informal engagement outside the parameters of a formal consultation. And that undermining is devoutly to be avoided because it is contrary, not merely to uh, the constitutional separation of powers and the ability of government and public to rationalise to, to make decisions about the process of decision making, but also in a much more practical sense because it uh, it might well disincentivise engagement. All the points I made earlier by reference to Bapio and or Justice Alas in the association of personal injury lawyers, paragraphs 43 to 45, which you will recall. Secondly, my learned friend says that there need not be a proposal with any content. There needs only to be a potential future decision. The core difficulty with that argument we submit is that, again, it is, it is far too broad if you include any potential future decision, you end up in territory in which you are in effect imposing 
a suite of obligations, consequential obligations in Gunning, which the government is almost bound to lose because you will not be able to satisfy any of those principles because you haven't got something which is capable of being put out as a proposal so as to trigger the provision of reasons for it, a justification for it, to which consultees can intelligently and must be able intelligently to respond. If you just characterise it as any potential future decision, you lose the requisite degree of specificity and concreteness, which is of the essence. proposal is not, we submit, as here, please provide background information on X, which will then be used to help us make a decision on Y. In the present case, there was neither a direct question about the strategy, what should it contain, nor any proposal to which the consultee could react. Consultees were merely asked about themselves. It, it isn't therefore correct to say we, we submit that seeking views on the issues facing disabled people equals making proposals. I come back to Lord Justice Morris K. in Medway. A consultation is a process within which a decision maker at a formative stage invites representations on one or more possible courses of action. Turning then uh, to the application of that principled approach on the facts, My submission is that uh, what the judge was confronted with was plainly not consultation, if the correct principled approach is applied, because the essential elements of what uh, should govern that characterization were absent. Uh, firstly, there was no proposal on which views were being sought. And indeed, the judge appears to have found that that was the position. See paragraph 75 of his judgment, in which he concluded, uh, in effect against the Secretary of State on the application of the common principles, that the Secretary of State did not advise the claimants or anyone else what she was proposing to include in the strategy. That, of course, was a demerit in terms of compliance with the Gunning principles. But as I've said, once one adopts the correct approach in principle, the Gunning principles have to be taken into account in shaping the nature of the characterization. And once they're taken into account at that stage, they, the absence of a proposal, as the judge has found, is in fact a strong indication that this isn't a consultation at all. And indeed, the evidence before the judge from the Secretary of State in the form of a statement from uh, Marcus Bell made entirely clear that at the time the survey was promulgated, the disability unit slash the Secretary of State had not decided what those proposals would be. And again, this appears to be accepted by the judge at paragraph 23 of his judgment. But for your note, if I may, uh, C for uh, that proposition, uh, the sequence of paragraphs in the statement of Mr. Bell, which you find in the supplementary appeal bundle, starting at page 3, line tab 1, and the relevant paragraphs for that purpose, again, it's probably worth a, a quick read, I'm sure the group has already speedily read this long old statement. I should apologise for its length, and I suspect that the length, length was in large part due to the fact that initially there was a rather broader challenge as to what constituted consultation, which took into account everything that had preceded the survey itself. So this statement had to deal with lots of them. I'll come back to that point. But for present purposes, i.e. Um, uh, 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 the evidence making clear that at the time of the survey, 
the Secretary of State hadn't even decided what the proposals would be. At C, the paragraphs 3.7 on page 7. Sorry, I... I'm... My lady, page 7, page, paragraph 3.7. Tab. tab 1, I'm saying Thank supplementary you. bundle. Sorry, sorry. Page 7, 3.7 and 3.8. Lots of description in the paragraphs that follow about the various different engagements that took place, and meetings with various stakeholders, and the different forms of engagement, and so on, over quite a prolonged period of time. None of which is said to be consultation anymore. And then you get to 8.1 and 8.2 as the next one, perhaps to alight briefly on. 8.1 on page 13 at the bottom. Turning to or summarising the theme, C 8.20 on page 20, to 8.20 on page 20. And then coming directly to the survey itself, which is another sort of sorry but a challenge, C 9.1. of what it did at 9.6 and 9.7 on page 24. And then back to what it did and didn't do and what it was and wasn't intended to do, see 9.11 on page 26. First point, as you know, is that there is that we make is that there is no proposal, and the evidence makes it absolutely crystal clear that there is no proposal from which views are being sought. The judge's criticism appeared to be that this was all circular. I think by that he meant it was circular because, as it were, it was gunning backwards. If that makes sense. Um, uh, but we respectfully submit that it isn't circular. It's a sequential analysis. It's necessary to see whether you are dealing with consultation at all. That was the nature of the analysis that Mr. Justice Sullivan conducted in Greenpeace. And as part of that, and in deciding what the constituent ingredients or elements of consultation, formal consultation for this purpose should be, it is plainly appropriate for the court to take into account what the consequential obligations that would flow from that characterization are. Because it makes no sense in public law to impose uh, those duties and therefore to characterize something as consultation in circumstances where you are in effect setting up the government to fail. In other words, the, the, the premise of the duties is that the building blocks of those duties are present. The respondents say that the judge did find that there was a proposal in the form of the strategy and its content. The, the disagreement, of course, however, is a fundamentally about what a proposal is. And we've responded directly to that point in the skeleton of paragraphs 29 to 30. Yes, the judge said he found that there was a proposal. No, the judge did not identify what its content was. On the contrary, he found that there was no attempt made at any stage to say what the 
Secretary of State was intending to include in the strategy. That's the specific finding of paragraph 75 of his judgment. And where could such content be found? It's clear that it wasn't intended to set out a suite of policy proposals or to set out what was going to be in the strategy. It was designed for a much more general, high-level and looser purpose than that. And it prompts the rhetorical question, how can the, pro the proposal be, as the respondents characterise it in their skeleton of paragraph 40, the form of the strategy and its content, when no one was told what that was? The key passages of the judgment, when you get to them for present purposes, are really paragraphs 61 to 66, which I'm going to make some submissions about in due course as a specific topic, if it were. But they seem to be premised, just to flag something at this stage, they seem to be premised on the fact that the Secretary of State that used information received from the survey in designing and in considering what should go into the strategy. In other words, finding in effect that if a decision is premised on information generated in an engagement exercise, that suffices to make it consultation. And one sees that in particular from some of the reasoning in paragraph 66, 63 and 65 of the uh, judgment. Take 63 as an example. When the survey was launched, said the judge, the link between it and the strategy was made perfectly explicit. I'll come back to why we say that was flawed, but uh, you will see um, the point immediately. It cannot just be that if you use information and information gathering processes, process to inform a subsequent decision, that makes it consultation. Otherwise, you could never have an information gathering process that wouldn't be consultation. And that's both, that would be both wrong in principle and thoroughly deleterious to the conduct of good government. So that's the first point about um, a proposal, no proposal. That's perhaps the key point. Secondly, we do submit that when viewed as a whole and on the basis of the evidence before the court, this was properly to be characterised as an evidence-gathering exercise or an information-gathering exercise that would or might lead to various policy proposals in the future. It didn't purport to identify any policy proposal with a view to enabling representation on such policy. In other words, to enable people to understand whether it was a good idea or not to go down a particular policy route. It was at a far higher level of generality. It had, in short, the features that we identify in our skeleton at paragraph four. Third point, it is telling me that for a number of uh, 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 the matters uh, uh, that uh, were dealt with, uh, 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 a specific promise of future consultation is made. So even in the strategy, when you get to that point, even in the strategy, those sorts of promises of future consultation are still being made indications that they will consult. Again, I'm not going to trawl through them, but just to give you some page references to make that point good, supplemental bundle, page 262, the Cabinet Office will progress work to require landlords to make reasonable adjustments to the common parts of leasehold and commonwealth homes. A consultation is planned for 2021, page 262. Page 265, the Department for Transport will consult on an update for the design standards for accessible stations this year. Page 279. In 2021, the Cabinet Office will consult on workforce reporting on disability for large employers exploring voluntary and mandated workplace transparency and publish a set of next steps. Page 281. BEIS will launch a consultation at the end of 2021 on making flexible working the default in Great Britain, unless employers have a good reason Page 288, DFE will consult on improvements to the SEM system through the SEM review. There's even an example 
uh, of a, a case in which consultation has in fact already taken place. Page 270, the Department for Transport has consulted on options to help local authorities address the issue of pavement parking more effectively and will announce the next steps later this year. That's page 21. So it's telling that there is lots of reference to future consultation, even when you get to the strategy uh, document. Uh, fourthly, uh, 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 um, uh, there is uh, no indication in the survey that there was an invitation to respond and an indication that the responses will be considered as part of deciding about specific policies. That's perhaps just a, an adjunct to the point about no proposal. The fourth point, just a noted. The fifth point I mentioned... I'm so sorry, Sir James, I didn't, I didn't get your fourth point. The fourth point was uh, uh, that there must be, remember I said there must be as well as a proposal an invitation to respond. Yeah and an indication that the responses will inform the decision. Those were some of the ingredients, and again, there isn't any of that linked to particular policies. You'll remember that one of the other, or this little suite of characteristics that we say uh, are relevant to, to the characterization issue given in our skeleton at paragraph 20, and one of those was the purpose or intent of the decision -making. Well, that we respectfully submit on the evidence before the judge could not have been clearer. I took you earlier to paragraph 3.7 of Marcus Bell's statement, uh, which makes entirely clear uh, that the purpose of this was evidence gathering, uh, and uh, the purpose of obtaining that evidence was to check various commitments that might or might not be uh, uh, put forward in advance and promulgated in the strategy. So the intent was not to consult. I wanted to touch very briefly, if I may, on uh, three or four points by way of direct response to the um, judge's judgment. Could I invite you to take up the judgment so you have the paragraphs before your eyes to make the submissions? Uh, and really, the critical analysis for present purposes is a single page in the judgment on page 49 of the core bundle, and it's paragraph 61 to 66 present purposes, because here is where the judge sets out the reasons for concluding that there was a consultation or a formal consultation attracting guns. As I say, four or five overarching points, if I may, on those paragraphs. The first overarching point uh, uh, it, it, it relates to paragraphs 61, 62, and 63. They all take the key feature as being in effect a move as the process goes on, that's the process, the full process covered in Mr. Bell's statement, as the process goes on to linking information gathering to potential impact on the strategy. So that's the key link that is made between the information gathering that the survey does and its potential impact on the strategy. And what we say about that is that it isn't in dispute or doubt that information gathering was being done for a purpose. Of course it was. That purpose was, of course, to inform the future review of existing commitments in the law and in policy that government has in relation to disability generally, and the consideration of other options, not doing this pointlessly. So they are undoubtedly doing it for that purpose. But that sort of general information gathering, as opposed to specific consultation on proposals, is absolutely bog standard across government, if I'm allowed to put it in that way. It isn't consultation in any proper sense, it's just engagement and information gathering. And if gunning applies to any information gathering process, then everything is caught. And not merely is everything caught, but you almost certainly will not be able to comply with the gunning principles because you're not doing the things that, they, that those principles require, namely to set out the proposal in a sensible way, enabling intelligent consultation responses in the light of a fair understanding of the reasons for the particular policy. 
you're just setting everyone up to fail. So it's overbroad in terms of what it catches, and it creates an impossible uh, situation for government to operate in with all the disincentives that Lord Justice Allard was so alive to. And one can take as an example of that paragraph 63 of the judgment, the references to the passages underlined in the judgment of paragraphs 25 and 26 earlier on. And if you wanted those documents, paragraphs 25 and 26 of the judgment, in the raw, they're in the supplemental bundle at 349 for the press release and 351 for the blog post. But the parts that the judge underlined tends to fall into three or so categories, putting lived experience at the centre or the heart of the strategy, putting it first, gathering views, hear from you first, listen to your views, or your views will inform the development of the strategy. And they, of course, need to be read in the context of everything that went before and of the actual questions asked in the survey. But if the point which is being driven at, which I think it is, if I may respectfully say so, if the point that's being driven at is that because there is that link between the information gathering and the strategy, that's it both entirely unsurprising and undisputed, uh, but, but also plainly insufficient because overbroad and creating all the difficulties I've just identified. So that's 61, 62, and 63 in a common theme or difficulty with those paragraphs. There is a specific point about 61 and 62 which may extend more broadly, but I take it as a point relating, my second point, and it relates principally to 61 and 62. It, it, it's a point I touched on earlier. It is to be noted that originally in this litigation, all of the process, from beginning of Bell to end of survey, all of the process was challenged as a consultation attracting gunning. That was not pursued. And when push came to shove, what was actually challenged and only challenged was the survey. It was said that the survey was it. But the, the difficulty with that you see immediately. And one sees, I hope, the flavour of it from the passages of Bell I took you to, Marcus Bell's statement that I took you to. The fact is that the survey is all part of the same piece. It is not different or distinct in character from all of the information gathering and the engagement that happened earlier. It's simply part of a continuum of information gathering and engagement for that purpose. And that tells you all you need to know about the true nature of the survey. And it does illustrate a central incoherence in the case that is now being mounted, because that case does not any longer challenge all the earlier parts of that process as satisfying the definition of consultation, but if that is right, and I am right about the survey being no, no different in character from the engagement that has gone before, still designed to produce information, still acknowledging the information gathering would feed into the uh, uh, ultimate strategy, uh, then uh, that is a, a troubling incoherence. Third point about the judgments, uh, the, the judgments uh, analysis between 61 and 66. The judge makes the point uh, fairly inaccurately at 63 and 64 that the word consultation that was used at various points. That is true, but my answer to it is the one that was given inter alia by Mr. Justice Sullivan in Greenpeace and by uh, Mr. Justice Simler in FDA, the question is one of substance, not form, and the fact that the word is used is not in truth of any real interest. What matters is what is the true nature of the process. Paragraph 65 of the judgment relies upon the strategy forward, and I make two points about that analysis. Firstly, I make the same one I've already made, namely uh, 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 that uh, plainly the government intended to use the engagement and the lis listening exercise when considering the strategy, but that fact does not make it consultation. Secondly, the true significance and 
use of the survey was in fact set out in considerable detail in Mr. Bell's uh, statement. And I've taken you to uh, uh, most of the uh, paragraphs there. Can I just make sure I give you the list in case I missed one out earlier? 3.6 and 3.7 of Bell. I'm not going to give you the supplemental bundle references again. 3.6 to 3.7, 8.20, 9.11, 9.17, so We respectfully submit that none of the um, uh, uh, points made by the judge at 61 to 66 uh, provide uh, any form of solid basis for a conclusion that this was formal consultation of the type considered uh, by Lord Justice Elias, and indeed they appear to be based on a misunderstanding the nature of the exercise and the correct approach in principle for all the reasons that I've given. That's what I wanted to say about the characterization issue. Can I turn briefly, and it will be briefly because I've covered a lot of it in the core principles that I gave you at the beginning, to the voluntary consultation, the consequential issue, the second ground. And I want to summarize, if I may, the argument in this way before coming briefly to a few of the cases that govern strict permission points and a few points, interesting points about stare decisis and all that. Um, uh, but uh, just before we get into that uh, uh, gentle and intricate territory, the argument on voluntary consultation, if I may. The nature of the issue is that if it is to be characterised as consultation, and uh, if what happened here, despite all the elements I've mentioned, is to be characterised as consultation, there is a consequential question. The next question is whether gunning automatically follows. And of course there is some degree of overlap, as you will have spotted no doubt in your reading, between the characterization issue and how you approach that, and this what follows issue. They're not hermetically sealed for obvious reasons. But on this one, the starting point is that in, in, in Cochrane, what has become the assumed wisdom was based on a concession without any indication from the court that it considered that concession to be correct and without any consideration of its basis. I'll come back to that when I deal with what I call the pure permission point. But the argument at this stage on its merits is grounded in the idea that all of the considerations that tend towards rationality being the test apply here and would apply here despite the fact that something is characterised as consultation. It is no doubt the case that consultation as a characterization imports some degree of structure and some greater formality of invitation and consideration than mere engagement. However, here the process remains a voluntary one, so you have neither the force of a legislative requirement nor the force of what public law has superimposed on the uh, imposition, namely legitimate expectation or conspicuous unfairness. You don't have those things in the situation that we are dealing with of voluntary consultation. And my submission is that it is that force that has driven the consequential obligations in Gunning. The more onerous the procedural obligations are, the greater the prior weight creating the obligation. And it's telling that when the law has asked the question, when is the obligation to consult created, leaving aside legislation and legitimate expectation, it's answered with a very narrow category indeed, that of conspicuous unfairness. And aside from that, the law has left the manner of decision making within the more open planes of executive judgment bounded only by rationality. 
And of course, those points are emphasized by the fact that the broader your characterization of consultation, if we were to go for a very broad consultation definition, the greater the force of these points. And that is because you move, and the further one moves, uh, uh, towards a broad characterization, the further one moves from that engine for the consequential gunning ob obligations being in place, the further you move, in essence, from conspicuous unfairness. And the focus on fairness is important here. We saw that in relation to the broad general principles that I went through at the beginning. Uh, and I gave you the reference to Lord Wilson's judgment in Mosley paragraph 25, page 594, behind tab 20, in which he concludes specifically that the gunning requirements are also based in fairness. And, and he's probably right about that. But that's what creates the link between the basis for imposing the obligation to consult and the gunning obligations applying. If you break that link, because you haven't got the fairness, you haven't got the, the fairness engine, as it were, for the imposition of the duty, then you're still imposing requirements that are fundamentally founded on fairness. So you've got a disconnect. And that is emphasised in particular when one bears in mind the clear and correct distinction that Lord Justice Singh drew in Kebble, where he was drawing the distinction, as you will recall, between consultation and the duty imposed by public law. The duty imposed by public law that he was talking about was also a fairness-driven duty which would only apply in certain circumstances where Audi Ultra and Partem or the duty to give an opportunity for representations would apply because fairness demanded that. And again, if you just create consultation as a big, broad, loose concept and then impose the consequential duties that are founded in fairness, that link is broken. And that key difference between procedural fairness on the one hand and what public law does with that and the default or usual position reflected in Thameside, but also in all the other principles you saw analysed in Plantagenet. That key difference between those two ideas has been repeatedly acknowledged. Um, one can go to uh, the Southwark case, if you just look way back when, you can go to the authorities bundle again, if you would, tab four. Mr Justice Lord, as he then was, in Southwark, page 132 is the one that I want. You will see the, the distinction again being drawn very, 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 very clearly. Uh, look at 132 and look at the last two sentences in the last full paragraph on the page. So it's just below the second whole page. In such a case, it is the decision maker's duty to acquaint himself with such facts as will enable him to reach an informed view about the relevant consideration in question, and in the nature of things that's likely to involve his consulting persons and bodies who may themselves have informed views about those facts. But this is not a duty of procedural fairness. It is inherent in the duty to arrive at a rational decision in the light of the statutory purpose for which the power in question is conferred on the decision. And you see exactly the same point and the same distinction being drawn in the sideline passage on page 134 over the page. It was a theme which Lord Justice Laws was obviously interested in because he returned to it in cartoon. <laughs> Uh, 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 tab 10 in the authorities bundle, please. For this purpose, page 345. So tab 10, page 345. And I want paragraph 27. And can I invite you to read really just the second half? Towards the end of paragraph 17. Perhaps if you pick it up between the below C, these two goods are often run into one another. And just read to the end of that paragraph, if you would. 
27, paragraph 27, sorry, on page 345. So you see that distinction again clearly being drawn. That was a distinction that was picked up on in the Plantagenet case. If you go forward to tab 19 again, and you go for this purpose to paragraphs 138 and 139, so tab 19, page 576. Those are important and recognised distinctions. And the key point for present purposes is that this argument, this ground two argument, focuses in essence on asking the question, what weight of circumstances requires the displacement of the usual accepted constitutional position that it is for government rationally to decide with whom to engage and how to go about doing that as an ordinary and necessary incident of good and efficient government. And I've made all the points that I wanted to make about what we say should be the correct approach to that. It shouldn't automatically follow just from a, a definition of something as consultation that, that the governing principle applies for all the reasons that I've given. One other point, perhaps just to flag, almost by way of a footnote, that there is real benefit in this context, I respectfully submit, in there being legal certainty to the extent that it can be achieved as to when uh, uh, the government will be subject to the duty to consult in this, in this sense, and therefore when it is to be subject to the gunning principles in its process of engagement. And, sorry, I've made you put um, Mr Justice Laws in Southwark away and I want it again for this purpose. Tab 4, page 131, because he makes the point that I want to make much more uh, clearly than I've done. But 131 behind tab 4. passage I want is in the middle paragraph on the page beginning I'm quite sure that the courts and I wanted to pick it up about three sentences in about five lines down it is important to have in mind that while I'm on 131 about halfway down reading halfway through the paragraph it's important to have in mind that while this area of the law is preeminently concerned with fairness notoriously a concept giving rise to different views as to its application in practice we are obliged sitting here to pay due respect to another principle a principle of legal certainty that would be intolerable if our jurisprudence did not make reasonably clear to public administrators whose task extends not to a single case but to the management of a continuing regime when the law obliges them to consult persons or bodies affected by the proceedings and when it does not. Uh, and that, we respectfully submit, applies both to the principles that govern the imposition of the duty and also to the, uh, it's, a, it's a requirement that equally exists in relation to the the need to have a real clarity about when, if you're going to expand a consultation as a consequential trigger of gunning, when that is to occur. The respondents effectively say, on the substance of this, well, what's the point of consulting if you don't comply with gunning? But our answer to that is, uh, 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 that's a question begging 
the B cannot provide a, a, an answer. The point is to conduct the exercise that, it can be assumed, the Secretary of State rationally judges would be useful or efficacious in the context of formulating government policy. And of course, consultation, however defined, is not a precondition of utility. You can still have useful engagement, which on no view would be consultation. Information gathering, perhaps being the paradigm example. The focus of gunning, by contrast, is on those ingredients being incidents of fairness. But that takes one straight back to the principal link between the driver for the obligation's existence and the incidence of it if imposed. It might also be thought that there is no real force in the what is the point point if, as is here the case, that there was plainly no intention to conduct a consultation of a kind that had any remote prospect of compliance. So that's the principled approach that we respectfully submit operates when considering a voluntary consultation and the question whether gunning automatically applies, even if you characterize something as consultation in a broad sense. And the only point I make about application of that principled approach in the present context is a single sentence point. On no view was conducting the exercise that was conducted here an exercise tainted by irrationality. And I turn then finally and briefly to the, um, the points about <coughs> concessions and, and all of that. And, and the, the question that I wanted to address, the principal question that I wanted to address, or the two principal questions I wanted to address and draw attention to some limited authorities on, are firstly, is the Court of Appeal bound by a concession made in a previous case? where that has then been taken as assumed wisdom in the cases ever after, as it were, but without further examination. And secondly, and again this can be taken very shortly, uh, what are the principles that, governing, that govern the Court of Appeal's grant of, com of permission for an appellant to take a new point on appeal? There's one that I want to go to on that. But to go back to my first question, is the Court of Appeal bound by a concession made in a previous case? We submit the answer to that is no, and that this represents a further exception, an acknowledged exception to the principle that the Court of Appeal binds itself, in other words, Young and Bristol Aeroplane Company, namely that a court is not bound by a proposition of law assumed by an earlier court that was not the subject of argument before or consideration by that court. And you have in the, I hope you'll have had given on your desk, and we've sent them electronically, a collection of authorities that flurry between the pair of us. You've got all the authorities that I of us were wanting to draw to your attention uh, in that short additional clip of authorities. And uh, I wanted to take you first, if I may, to Kadeem. That's, that's the head of the but uh, uh, Hetherington, and that is page 916 behind the first tab. And the passage I want for present purposes is between uh, D and H on page 925 in my judgment. Number again, please, Sir James. Page 925, my lady. 925. Behind tab one. So these page numbers, I, I hope, follow sequentially to the authorities you already have. But 925, 10 in the report itself. So this and is eight. Hetherington. You did this say Kadeem. I did say Kadeem. I'm sorry. I know I changed my mind. No, it's fine. Go to it in chronological order. But Hetherington is the one. Yes. So it's um, Sir Nicholas Brown Dawkins. Page 925, between G and E. In my judgment, just that paragraph. 
Yeah, thank you. So you will see. That there is no binding force, even if the decision on the point of law was essential to the earlier decision. Because even if it's one part of the ratio, it was assumed that they were subject to a concession for example. And then Kadeem, sorry, that's in the next tab, tab two, starting on page 929. For present purposes, I want paragraph 33 which is on page 939. And you'll see the proposition of principle at 33. And they explain why they say it is justified. They acknowledge and agree with the paragraph that I've just shown you from Sir Nicholas Brown Wilkinson's judgment in Hetherington at paragraph 35. And they then set out at paragraph 38 some limits to that rule, which you need to have your attention drawn to. So could you read paragraph 38? Then the final uh, bit I wanted before just drawing together some of the themes is uh, cross on precedent. Which, despite its age and despite the covering page it's behind tab five. Despite its age and despite the fact that the copy from the, the book from which the copy was taken appears to have been damaged. You can see it's one over one over. Um, you will see the passage I want is at 1012, and it's the final paragraph in the extract. The upshot of these decisions is a loosening of the doctrine of stare decisis. It doesn't encompass ratios and decide in my, but where it can be inferred that the deciding court did not address its mind the proposition of law, even if that proposition was essential to its decision, and that inference can easily be drawn from the absence of any argument on the point in question. The, the uh, authors did, of course, have the benefit of. Uh, uh, Hetherington, they did not at that stage have the benefit of the Court of Appeal in Cadeen because of the date of the publication, but Cross remains the leading text on precedent. So just to emphasise a couple of points, if I may, um, it, it, it is, we submit, quite clear from Cadeen and from Hetherington that the principle applies even where the proposition of law was an essential step in the reasoning. See Hetherington in the passage I've taken you to and see Kadeem at paragraph 36. And indeed see Cross. In Cochran, which you have behind tab 5 of the main Bible of authorities, as you will recall, at paragraph 108, page 182, I don't invite you to turn it up again, but the Court of Appeals says, as you will recall, it is common ground that whether or not consultation of interested parties in the public is a legal requirement, if it is embarked upon, it must be carried out properly. That's the, that's the statement. And there are no other cases identified by any of the parties before this court that do, that do anything other in effect than just repeat that point. It's then assumed and received as wisdom thereafter. It 
it therefore does continue to meet, we respectfully submit the Cadeen gloss, if I'm allowed to call it that, in paragraph 38 of the reason. The proposition in question has thereafter been assumed and has not been the subject of a decision. We submit that this is an example of a case uh, uh, in which the subsequent court, be it High Court or Court of Appeal, uh, is not uh, bound to decide that gunning flowed as it were, from a, a voluntary consultation, because you are in the territory identified in Hetherington, Cadeen, and in Cross. That's the short submission we make. As to when the Court of Appeal will grant permission for a new point to be taken on appeal, uh, again, this will be very, very well known to the Court, I suspect, but the leading authority in relation to that, just to show you the relevant bits, are back in the main authorities bundle, and they're in a case called London Borough of Brent against Johnson, which is uh, authorities main bundle, Tab 29, which starts at page 860. The passages I want are at page 870. Well, the title that you will see, and I hope the relevant passages have been flagged. Particular paragraphs 38 uh, through to the end of 41. Yeah, it's, that, it's really that page and a half to two pages. I think it will just as Lewis. So those are those are the paragraphs that set out the, the, the well-known principles, and we submit, as you know, that we are in territory in which we satisfy those conditions. My ladies, my lord, uh, that is, th 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 those are my submissions in opening the appeal, uh, unless I can seek to assist further at this stage. No, thank you very much. Very good. Um, Ms. Hannett, do you follow? Thank you. Richard. Um, my ladies, my lord, uh, as the court knows, um, Mr. Brach and I represent three disabled individuals, four um, at the time of the hearing yeah. before Mr. Justice Hill. Um, you have, at the end of the supplemental bundle, statements from each of them, statements that were, of course, before the judge in the court below, which set out their perspectives on the issue before the court, um, and in particular on the issue of the survey. Uh, I'm not going to take the court to them now. There might be a handful of passages I come back to later. If I may just give the references and invite the court to, to read them. The statement of Victoria Horn is in the supplemental bundle, page 354. The statement of Douglas Pulley at um, page 358. There are then two statements from Jean Evely, um, pages 363 and 372. And then the statement from the late Miss Binder at page 368. Uh, and as I said, I invite the court to... Uh, have to read those if the court hasn't already done so, it may all be done so. Um, 
my learned friend opened with a number of general submissions and propositions about um, public law principles. Um, to the extent that I need to, I'll come back to those at a later stage. But I've simply one observation, or perhaps two observations I want to make at the outset in relation to them. Um, the, the first is this, fairness is not, in, in my respective submission, to be regarded as an exception to the principle that says everything is governed essentially by, by rationality. It's a parallel principle and an equally vital constraint upon uh, executive decision making, not a poor relation. Uh, and then secondly, insofar as any distinction between the idea of public participation uh, and the Audi Alta and Partem rule is concerned, both clearly have their roots in fairness. That's obvious in relation to the latter and in relation to the question of border public participation. That's clear from the Supreme Court's decision in Moses. Um, but as I say, I'll, I'll come back, if I may, to some of them, uh, Sir James's border points and, and issues in relating to the case law um, at a later stage of my submission. Um, the, the structure of my submissions will be as follows. I'm going to deal first with the sole original ground of appeal, issue one in our skeleton, and the question of whether the judge Aired, um, or, or, or was entitled to come to the view that this was in substance a consultation, albeit a flawed one. I'll then turn to the second ground of appeal, address you on the question of permission and why we say the Secretary of State should not be permitted to raise it now, and then address you on the substance issue two as characterised in our uh, skeleton argument. A brief summary of our submissions on these points is set out in paragraph 11 of our skeleton. I won't go, go to that now. Thank you. So it is common ground, dealing with issue one, therefore, that the question of whether the actions of a public body or the process upon which a public body embarks amounts to consultation, it is to be decided as a matter of substance rather than form. So James has already taken you to the judgment of uh, Mrs. Justice Kimmler, as she then was in the FDA case, and so I don't need to go back to that. And that is the approach that the judge took at, at at first instance. Um, in our skeleton argument, we have made reference um, in relation to this part of the case to the decision of the Supreme Court in Mosley. And I'm just going to invite the court to turn to that briefly, if I may. It's behind tab 20. <coughs> Uh, and its page starts on page 583 of the authorities bundle and um, the relevant passage is page 593 uh, and picking it up at the top of the page um, Lord Wilson says second line irrespective of how the duty to consult has been generated the same common law duty of procedural fairness will inform the manner in which the consultation should be conducted. So fairness goes both to whether and then if there is consultation, how it should be undertaken. And then we see set out in paragraph 24, the purposes of consultation identified by Lord Wilson there, essentially three purposes um, set out just above the letter C on the page. Liable to result in better decisions, ensuring the decision maker receives all relevant information and that it's properly tested. Secondly, involves the sense of injustice, which the person who is the subject of the decision will otherwise feel. And then thirdly, the um, idea of the democratic principle at the heart of society, the question of, again, it's there, in particular, of public participation. Uh, and we suggest that in in looking at what consultation is, it is um, uh, informative to understand, instructive to understand the purposes of consultation. It's to ensure that the requisite information is available to the decision maker. The first grant, the first purpose, the, the idea of making a better or more informed decision. And then it's to ensure that those 
who may be affected by a decision have an opportunity to influence it, and that feeds into both the second and the third purposes. And, and I like the court to bear that in mind. I'll come back to what I say the significance of that is um, at, at a later stage. Um, turning then at, to the judgment of Mr. Justice Griffith and the material on which his decision was based. And I'm going to take what is in that order, looking at the, his judgment, looking at the material before him, and then coming to some of the authorities and Sir James' uh, submissions in that regard. Because this is an appeal against his judgment. Uh, uh, it's a review that the court is undertaking, and the court requires to be satisfied that the judge was wrong. Uh, and you have in our skeleton argument at paragraphs 34 and 35, authorities with which I'm sure this court is um, um, extremely familiar about the restraint um, um, uh, that should be exercised and the particular role of the appellate court. Um, perhaps if I just take you two days because there's a couple of additional references um, as well as those set out in the skeleton argument. So the authorities bundle, uh, starting at tab 25, this is the group 70, starting page 689 of the bundle. And if the court turns to page 704, you will see set out at the bottom of page 704, paragraph 21, under the heading Appellate Restraint. Um, the observations of the court important to bear in mind the proper approach of an appeal court uh, and then a, a spectrum of matters at the one hand find pure findings of primary fact and pure questions of law at the other end and in my respect the submission in relation to this ground of appeal we're at neither extreme end of the spectrum but somewhere along the spectrum uh, and then it, you will see um, I, I invite the court to read to the extent it needs to in um, paragraph 21. Uh, I don't propose to go through the authorities set out in paragraph 22, but you'll see the, the penultimate authority <coughs> cited in paragraph 22 is the uh, Abliazov case. And then there was a citation from that in paragraph 23 of the judgment uh, in um, group 7. Um, and if you turn over the page to page 760, Um, I invite the court's attention um, to what is set out in paragraph 43. It should be the sideline passage that the court may already be read it and will no doubt be familiar with it. In terms of the role of the court. And then in the context of judicial review, the same principles apply. Clearly there will be less scope for primary findings of fact on the basis of oral evidence, but the same broad principles apply. And we can see that from Smek Properties Limited behind tab 21, page 602. This was an appeal against a, a judgment in a um, judicial review of the Grant of Planning Commission. Uh, and I can just uh, refer to the court to page 609. Paragraph 29, at the bottom of the page, and the top of the next page, where Lord Justice Sale says this. Oh, well, in fact, I'll rather than read it aloud, so I just invite the court to, to, to cast your eyes over uh, paragraph 29. And then to the judgment of Mr. Justice Griffith. But, but I'm sorry to interrupt, Ms. Richard. So you you submitting that what the judge was doing in this case was making findings of fact. Well, the question of whether um, uh, um, what was undertaken amounted to a consultation 
yeah. is a mixed question of fact and law. Mm. So it's not, it's not a pure finding of fact. It's not a pure finding of fact, nor a pure finding of law, as I indicated earlier. It's, it's, it's in a spectrum somewhere along the middle. How did he define consultation? <coughs> um, might I come back to that, my lord? Uh, he doesn't give a specific definition of consultation. He identifies the factors that he refers to. Uh, consultation is not a, um, not in fact, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, a legal term of art, which has been defined in terms um, in, in any uh, of the authorities which the, the parties have placed before you. I mean, so, would you would you accept that it's a word that's got a wide range of meaning in ordinary usage? Yes, of course. So, for example, if um, a local authority uh, puts on its website a survey about its bin collection service and asks people to respond, are you happy, are you unhappy, is it good, what's bad about it, um, is that a consultation? Um, it depends what the local authority um, is planning to do or not do. So um, you can't, in my sub respectful submission, just look at the... Um, the um, steps that are taken by the public body in isolation from the use which the public body proposes to make of that material. So we entirely accept, um, my lady, my lord, that there is a, um, th there can be information gathering exercises or evidence gathering exercises which are not consultation. But, we, but, but, the norm, but, but would you accept that some people might describe such exercises as a consultation? Some people might so describe it, yes. Right. If the local authority's position is, we are looking to change the way in which we organise our rubbish collection facilities, uh, and for the purpose of assisting us to decide whether and if so how we make those changes, we are inviting members of the public who will be who might be affected by any changes that we make um, to answer a series of questions. That might be for consultation, whereas a broad information gathering exercise um, that isn't for any specific policy development, strategy development, specific anticipated decision making process might not. But, but isn't it necessary right at the beginning to distinguish in some way between um, those two different ways in which the word consultation can be used? Well, consultation can obviously be used in a, in a number of different ways across a range of different contexts, legal and other, involving public bodies, not involving public bodies. So I would certainly accept that broad point. Yeah. It's the, um, whether something is a consultation for the purposes of attracting um, a characterization as such and identifying what consequences flow in law mm. will vary depending upon the context. I, I will come back to this issue, my lady, I promise, but in, yeah. in, in relation to um, just was judging some of the points that, that, or anticipating some of the points that I may need to make in response to, to, to James, we don't accept, for example, there has to be a proposal. Clearly, there can be concrete proposals which are the subject of consultation. And, and many of the authorities have arisen in such a context. But there may be consultation in the sense of a public body going out to a cohort of people or bodies, asking for their views, um, where that is going to be, uh, uh, where that may be in relation to broad questions of policy or prioritization, or, or maybe on the question of whether a policy should be developed, and if so, what kind of issues the policy should adopt. But that, too, can be a consultation. Sorry, when you say that, too, can be a consultation, are you saying that that exercise would attract gunning duties? Uh, I, I just want to understand yes. what you mean when you use the word consultation because you've accepted that the word has a range of meanings and what we're interested in is the, the, the class of consultations that would attract the duties. So, so you're saying, as I understand it, you're submitting that 
for those duties to be attractive, there does not have to be a specific proposal which the public body is consulted on. Is that right? Uh, Melody, can I take it in stages? Yes, of course. Um, many of the authorities have arisen um, in the context of there being specific proposals, yeah. specific options that have been identified. And they can be very specific indeed, should this daycare centre be closed. Mm. Um, um, uh, and then there is an invitation to those who may be affected to respond. Yeah. That is, on any view, within the class of consultation which attracts the, the label of such in the authorities um, and, and in the context of the legal principles with which we're concerned. M my submission is that consultation in that sense is not limited to such cases. And so there may be consultation on matters that are higher level, that are more general in nature, that are more strategic or policy laden in nature rather than a specific decision about perhaps the cessation of a service or the withdrawal of a benefit. Well, I understand the submission. Are, are there any case, can you show us any cases in which um, a court has held that asking the public about a higher level thing, like a policy, has attracted the duty? Well, when this isn't a case in which there is a duty to consult, so we're in the voluntary consultation yeah. case. So, um, my lady, quite often there are consultations of that high level nature which take place pursuant to a statutory duty. Well, but that's different. Well, my lady, of course it's different, but it, it, mo the majority of the cases in which there have been, in fact, I think at the moment I cannot think off the top of my head of a voluntary consultation case mm -hmm. that falls within the category well, that's that my lady has identified. Was directed towards. Um, but it's right to understand if we're talking, first of all, not about. Um, uh, voluntary or mandated, but what is a consultation? Yeah. There are statutory duties to consult at a high level, for example, in the National Health Service Act 2006. But there I, are, I, at the moment, I'm not really seeing how those help, because precisely because they've been imposed expressly by Parliament. Well, because what happens is still a consultation, even though the, the duty obviously is a statutory one, but it's still characterised as a consultation. In the, even though there are not specific principles, or sorry, specific proposals or options that are the subject of the exercise. Um, okay, may I go back to of course, my yes. question? Um, I asked how the judge declined a consultation. Um, you say he made an unappeal, unappealable finding of fact um, that this was a consultation. But I think he comes to his conclusion at paragraph 60. Well, that, that, that's where he sets out his conclusion, that this is a consultation. Um, he looks at what's said and done at the time as opposed to any ex post facto evidence from, from, from Mr. Bell. Uh, and then he draws a distinction between a general information gathering exercise, which would not be characterised as a consultation, and then something which then takes on the shape of a consultation because it's specifically looking for... Um, views, input, information, um, uh, insights, perspectives that will inform an anticipated decision-making process. So it's not an abstract exercise of, well, we just want to do a survey to understand the degree of unhappiness within our local area about bin collection, or the degree of unhappiness in our local area about the organisation of hospital facilities, or priorities for government spending within the Department of Transport, or whatever it might be. What brings this into the category or class of consultation is the combination of what it was the Secretary of State said she was doing uh, and the purpose for which it was being undertaken. Well, he comes to that conclusion paragraph 66. Well, it begins in, in paragraph 61. Okay, yes. 
61 to 66. Yes. But the climax of it, if you can put it that way, is the reference to immediate commitments and ambitious changes. Well, these paragraphs contain um, a short summary or proceed of the material um, on which he relied and to which he was taken um, and which he sets out in some greater detail at the earlier part of his judgment. Mm. What I w want to do is take the court to the actual material he refers to. But I still don't understand how he defined the consultation. Oh, it, it, it's an exercise of um, engaging with an identified cohort of um, or, or, or class of people, disabled people and their carers being the primary um, cohort to whom this exercise was undertaken for the purpose of understanding and eliciting their views that's the word that's used so it's not just evidence about their own lived experience their views solutions is also used so as to um, uh, shape a, a specific policy strategy, whatever one wants to call it, so material difference for present purposes, that, that the Secretary of State was proposing to introduce. Well, that could, could be very wise indeed. It wasn't a specific policy, as I understand it. And it um, it's over a whole range of the strategy as it ultimately emerged um, covers both a, a series of sp quite specific matters and much more high level matters. So it's, it's a range of matters that are encapsulated within the strategy that was ultimately published. So to approach it from the opposite end, um, if the survey was unlawful, could the survey have attached the strategy and said, what do you think about the strategy? I'm just trying to understand what a lawful consultation would look like if one applies the approach which the judge appears to have applied. Well, there are two um, respects in, in, in which um, the consultation would need to have been undertaken differently if it was to be lawful. The first is um, something of a, along the lines my lady has suggested, but it doesn't have to be attaching a draft strategy or a draft policy, because quite often consultation is undertaken, whether voluntarily or pursuant to a duty, um, at an earlier stage of a decision-making process. Um, but part of it entails providing some information about um, um, what might, what is in the contemplation of the decision maker, the kind of areas and issues um, and um, initiatives uh, that the decision maker um, uh, has in mind at that stage. But the second part is to um, uh, undertake that process of interaction or engagement in a way that permits of intelligent response. And that's the issue in relation to the structure of the survey, the nature of the questions asked with the multiple choice answers, and the very limited scope for any kind of textual input. Uh, and it's a question of looking at how that marries up with what the Secretary of State said she was doing and intended to when embarking upon the process. Well, is this verging into a legitimate expectation argument? She said she'd do X, she hasn't done it, therefore she should have done it. Mm, it it's not a legitimate expectation argument, my lady. It's a... Um, um, if, if you voluntarily embark upon a decision-making process, the question of whether you have done so fairly may bring into play all sorts of different factual matters and considerations. Um, but if you say, well, I'm voluntarily embarking upon this because I want to ascertain X, Y, and Z, and then the way in which you go about it doesn't allow you to get answers to X, Y, and Z, it's not, it doesn't have to get into the territory of legitimate expectation. One says, well, what you've done is not fair. But why, I'm sorry, why is it unfair? Take the, if you go to paragraph 26 of the judgment, the judge
much helpfully set out a blog post on the WK website to accompany the survey. Um, suppose that the survey had simply consisted of this blog post with electronic means for people who read it to send in their, their comments. 21st century equivalent of answers on a postcard or like that. Suppose that's all it had done. Um, would, it, would that have been unlawful? Um, it's not easy to answer that in, 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 in the abstract, my lord, but um, in part it would depend the, the, as I said, there are two, two aspects in which we suggest the consultation was unlawful. The first is in terms of the information that was provided, and then the second in terms of how the facility by which responses could, could, could be given. What my Lord has indicated might address the, the second of those two points, um, to some extent at least, but yeah, not well, the first as well. Supposing there had been no accompanying information that the disability unit simply puts out two or three pages on a website saying, and I'm looking at the passages the judge underlined, but they're obviously important, we want to have the lived experience of disabled people at the centre of our strategy. We're launching an online survey to, to um, obtain your views. We want to hear from you firsthand. We hope to collect a range of viewpoints on the survey. And it culminates by saying, us, saying please send in um, would would that have been a consultation, and would it have been unlawful? Um, firstly, it, it would have been a consultation, um, um, assuming that it, it built within it or was intended for the purpose of then informing the development of, of, of the strategy or policy. Yes. If it was simply um, un unconnected with any anticipated specific decision making. Um, a survey to understand more about the difficulties faced by a cohort of the community. That in itself would not amount to a consultation. No, no, of course, of course it gets so assuming that, that. The blog post says we want to create a national strategy for disabled people which drives positive change. It, it would still be deficient because it would not provide really any meaningful information to those being consulted to enable them to know what kind of information, views, insight, perspectives were being sought or would be of assistance. And so to expect... It would have been a... It, it, it is a consultation, you say, within um, dummy and proctor, and it, it would be deficient because um, it didn't give sufficient information for what Sorry, I didn't it, it, it would not meet the second gunning criteria. It would not give sufficient information to enable intelligent response. And it is important to understand here the cohort of those who are being consulted. So people with disabilities or, or their carers. Um, in order for them to be able to meaningfully contribute to the development of the strategy, which is what the relevant ministers were saying was, was, was essential and integral, some information, some shape, some content needed to be given to enable them to do so if they were not simply then to write a, a description of their life and the, and, and, and the barriers that they, um, that they face, which is what if if you look at one of the um, respondent statements, is how she felt the survey came to her. So what my Lord posits would overcome the difficulty of the restriction of the survey, the fact that the questions didn't actually permit um, anything other than these multiple choice answers, didn't permit anything in terms of context or nuance or explanation, or identification of what the barriers were and how they impacted, as opposed to a one of five boxes for each question. So it would, it would potentially avoid that difficulty, but would still be insufficient.
your, your submission seems to assume that um, public bodies go around collecting information for the sake of it um, with, with no connection with underlying policy. But surely the whole point about collecting information is that it is bound to be collected for the purpose of informing what the public authority does with its public law powers. Well, indeed, there are so many different respects, ways and contexts in which a, a public body may gather information that it's um, it's really a proposition I can neither agree with nor disagree with. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's that public bodies collect information for no good purpose whatsoever. Mm. It may obviously be the case in extreme circumstances, but not relevant for, for, for the issues with which this court is concerned. But what I'm troubled by is, is the breadth of this submission, because uh, if one assumes that public authorities don't embark on expensive information gathering exercises with no link to um, policies, um, potentially these duties will attach to any such information gathering exercise. Well, I don't, I, I don't accept that that's correct. Firstly, okay. um, public bodies do embark upon general information gathering exercises for all, all, all sorts of reasons um, and occasions, um, uh, which may simply be um, with a view to um, um, uh, um, having a store of information which they may then want to use at some point in the future, which may be useful at some point in the future, when they're then looking to determine whether they should adopt particular courses of action or, or particular policies or, or, or particular strategies or, or particular priorities. All right. So um, uh, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not then that they're, they're embarking upon the information gathering exercise foolishly or fancifully or for no purpose. Um, but it's not tied to a specific policy that they are working on at that point in time and which they say they need this information in order to shape that policy. And, and that's the distinction. It's the latter kind of case that we're concerned with. And we're concerned, of course, with voluntary consultation in this context. So in terms of burdens upon public bodies, by the very nature of the issues in the case, these are burdens to the extent that that's the right noun. It probably isn't, um, given the purposes of consultation identified by Lord Wilson in, in, in Mosley. But these are ones which they are voluntarily deciding will be useful to them for a particular identifiable purpose. Well, that's not. If, 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 if they would just come out with a disability strategy without any public consultation, they would have been criticised and, and rightly. Can, can I hypothesise an even shorter request for, for um, response? Suppose the um, disability unit had simply put out a one page. website publicised it saying uh, we are in the early stages of developing a disability strategy. Our ambition is to make a really positive difference in the lives of disabled people. We would welcome um, your writing in to tell us firstly if you are a disabled But what we would like to know is give us up to three ideas about how you say government can realistically improve your lives. Suppose that's all they said. Would, would that be a consultation and would it be unlawful? Um, my Lord, I'm, I'm going to um, give you what is my provisional answer to that. Uh, but if I may reserve the right to yes, come back, having thought about it over the lunch adjournment, yes, um, and, and in particular thought about it with um, those who sit behind me, including my clients. Um, my initial response is that that would probably be the information gathering exercise rather than consultation. Because it is um, it's simply an open question 
um, to the world at large um, uh, if they feel that they fall within a particular uh, um, category to send their views to the government. Uh, and so um, with, with the qualification I indicated, yeah. that, that, that is my instinct, initial instinctive response to my Lord's question. Do, do, do come back to us if you have second thoughts. Um, but what, what I'd like to do, if I may, is take you through the material that the judge relied on, not by reference to his judgment, but by reference to the material in the supplemental bundle, because his judgment, although it quotes from some of it in full in, in other areas, is, is merely a summary. has the supplementary bundle to hand, um, and I'm starting with, with, with the material that the judge relies on in paragraph 61 of the Supreme Judgment. Um, so if the court turns to page 149, And so um, this is um, the initial um, um, document published on the uh, appellant's website on the 15th of January 2021 in relation to the survey. And, and there's the document overview. Um, and so you'll see under the heading on page 149, developing a national strategy for disabled people, publication plan for spring 2021. So a, a, what we say is um, um, not just the abstract gathering of information for general purposes, um, but, but a, a, a specific intention in relation to a national strategy. Well, and that, then, no, sorry, that sentence tells you what the disability unit is doing. The next paragraph tells the reader what, what the purpose of the survey is. Am I wrong about that? Yes, if, if we, it, it absolutely does. The two are then tied together at the bottom of the page, my lady. So that's the national strategy. The next paragraph then says, we need to hear about your views and know more about your experiences. Uh, the survey will ask about your life experiences, either as a disabled person or care or parent of someone who has an interest in disability issues. There's then a reference to COVID. And then bottom of the page, the survey will be open until the 23rd of April. Responses received before the 28th will inform the development of the national strategy. So there's the link between the survey and the national strategy. Yes, but it's responses to the survey will inform the development of the strategy. I mean, I, I, what does one read into that? They're saying that they will use the information from the survey in order to develop the strategy. Yes, a strategy which is under development at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. Um, I, mean, Lydia, I hope the position will become clear when we've gone through all the material. There isn't a huge amount of it. Um, but it's under development at the time, so it's not a, not a blank sheet, um, say that might as well be from the purposes of those responding to the consultation or responding to the invitation to, to, to complete the survey. Uh, um, uh, and... Um, People are being told that what they say will shape the development or inform the development of the strategy without knowing anything about what the strategy itself will focus upon. And then if we go to um, uh, just page 152 and 153, you will see under the heading Privacy Notice um, reference to consultation. I don't place a huge amount of weight on the use of the language consultation, but I do want to just show you where it appears. It's towards the bottom of page 152. Please read the privacy notice before you begin the consultation. And then you'll see on the next page, give us your views online survey and, and reference UK disability survey slash consultation. <coughs> that, that's the, um, uh, the origin of the survey. If you then turn in the same bundle to page 349, You have of the same date the press release that was issued. And so bottom half of page 349 explains 
um, disability units, etc., is working to deliver, develop and deliver a national strategy. Um, third paragraph, the strategy will make practical changes to policies which strengthen disabled people's ability to participate fully in So society. sorry, Ms. Richards, my fault. I missed the page reference. Page 349. 349. Thank you so much. Bottom of the page. Uh, so I was just referring, I've referred to the first paragraph, referring to the third paragraph, which it sets out what the strategy is intended to do, make practical changes to policy, uh, which strengthen disabled people's ability to participate fully in society, um, face fairness at the heart of government, etc. And we want to place the lived experiences of disabled people at the centre of our approach, as well as views from people across the country. Today we're launching a public survey to gather views um, uh, the, society, the survey continues the engagement carried out through 2020 and continues to be here, nationally and across the regions, etc. Uh, and then um, on page 350, the second paragraph, um, if you share your views by the 28th of February, your views will inform the development of the national strategy for disabled people. So there again, um, the, the link being um, articulated between the ongoing decision-making process in relation to the strategy, which is said to be intended to make practical changes to policies but doesn't identify any substantive content and then the invitation to respond um, and then we have and perhaps the final document before um, we break the um, again of the same date page 351 the blog post Again, perhaps just picking it up on the third paragraph, we want to deliver practical action through policies which will make a real difference. We want to create a national strategy with your voice at the heart of the process. Therefore, we want to have the lived experience of disabled people at the centre of our strategy. We'd also like to hear the views of carers, relatives of disabled people and those of the general public. And then under the heading, how can you join in? We're initially launching an online survey um, which will cover different topics important to disabled people and understanding the barriers in their way. This is a part of our ongoing consultation um, and, and certainly that's the, therefore the disability unit's use of the word and marks the start of our insight gathering uh, and then over the page you will see um, the box with the picture have your say on the national strategy for disability for disabled people so an indication there that it's a it's a um, it's a contribution to, if I leave aside the word consultation, on, on the national strategy itself. And then under the heading, a structured conversation. Our aim is to lead a structured conversation to hear about people's daily lives. This will inform our national strategy with the lived experience of the people most um, affected. Um, you'll have seen there are a number of references to, to um, uh, getting information about lived experience. Um, when I come back to the documents after the lunch adjournment, I'll show you then how it broadens out into inviting views and solutions. Thank you. Um, so we'll resume at two, please. Thank you.